Good morning. Thank you for your patience with the technology issue this morning. I hope that next week, we have another one next week, it will be uh, easier. We have today a large team here. It's the end of the COMPASS project. And for once, COMPASS does, is not an acronym, so it stands for nothing, essentially, I think. The presentation will be given by all the members of the consortium together. So Kumar Dev from Thales something, because it has changed name about three times in the life of the, of the <coughs> project, will, as project uh, leader, will introduce uh, the other speakers. We will have Massimiliano from Inaxis, who will talk about the data mining he did on safety events, safety relevant events, as you will see. We will have Andreas Horst from the University of Aachen, who will talk about their contribution, very much a computer science contribution, so it's a, a new player in this ATM field. And then a person who did probably was a technical lead and who did probably the most uh, of the integration job as well, because you will see actually a prototype of, the, of a tool that was being developed in the, in the project will be by Dimitris Kolovos from the University of York. So I hand over to <coughs> Kumar. Thank you, Mark, and uh, welcome to the presentation, Colin, Dirk, and all the rest of you. I don't know your names. Nice to see you here. As Mark already mentioned, we are going to do a demonstration of a prototype at the end, but also take you through the whole process of the flow. What did we do? Why did we do it? How did we do it? What came out of the results? Uh, I will be followed by Dimitris, yes. and then by Masmilano, and finally by Andreas. So what was COMPASS? Uh, I think this is the context, very clearly we are on <coughs> team 3 of Work Package E. We are talking about automated safety management support, which is not in itself radical, but using ICT approaches. That was the sort of angle that we brought to the domain. The medium project, we are at the last month. The budget has been used, I can assure you of that and these are the consortium members. Sorry, using ICT approaches? Yes, so ICT is Information Communication Technologies. It's, the, it's basically a set of technologies that use computer science and computing as a backbone. So this is everything from the video conferencing system here to high performance computing and all the rest of that. So why did we want to do this and why did Thales want to get involved in this? We recognize that ATM systems are complex and heterogeneous. These two words have a direct implication on what we were trying to do within Compass. And most importantly that there is a number of independent components that need to communicate. And they're also predominantly safety related. So if you have a failure, you could have a major loss of life, etc. We wanted to identify using ICT a combination of events and to data mining essentially and predict with a high degree of probability, that is the key, where the situation or where the safe operation is compromised. This is really about MTCD, medium term conflict detection, but effectively we're looking at high reliability predictions ahead of time. That is the gain, the, the value add. These were the expected outcomes, so we want to reduce the amount of human intervention. That's not to say that humans should be out of the loop or we're trying to change the controller ATM system relationship, but it was about reducing error and generating warnings for ATM experts and for the controllers ahead of time. And then also within the scope of CESAR, we wanted to bring in this ICT aspect, which I think is something that is new. And from Thales, we were very interested in that because of course we have a lot of systems and products in this domain. And now we, our new roadmap will incorporate some of the results of CESAR. We'll talk about that later on. So that's at least one of the good things that has come out of Compass is that the results will be translated into products and services in the years to come. And now I hand over to Dimitris, who will right. uh, okay. take over from this point onwards. And thank you. Thank you very much. The main aim of uh, Compass um, was to uh, identify patterns of events that can compromise the safe operation of an ATM system. And in particular, uh, we wanted to perform um, safety-related event detection and classification and issue early safety uh, warnings. So we wanted to be able to identify potential safety-related events, classify them according to the probability they have of uh, materializing, and produce warnings to operators. And we also wanted to enable domain experts to experiment with, uh, with safety patterns both on real data and on artificial operational scenarios. We've integrated all the work 
done in Compass in the context of a prototype that uh, uh, Mark and Kumar Dev mentioned, which we call the Compass Early Safety Warning System. And effectively what it is, desktop-based application that can analyze the traffic that go through a sector during a 24-hour period. It supports both flight plans and the radar tracks, which have been provided to us by CFMU. It supports uh, conflict detection based both on flight plans and radar tracks. It also supports conflict filtering through pattern matching based on patterns that have been mined by looking at past data. So this is a first screenshot of the system. Here you will see an airspace. The green points are the entry points, blue points are the exit points of the sector. Here you will see the, uh, the traffic. And this is a visualization of the flight plans for this day. When we switch to the radar, uh, to the radar tracks for exactly the same, uh, the same time, so 6.20 in the morning, you will notice that aircrafts are not really where they were expected to be. There are slight deviations, which is to be expected. Based on this data on flight plans and live radar tracks, we perform a conflict prediction. We can do that in a configurable time window. For example, here we are looking at the 60 minutes in advance, and you can see that the system identifies three conflicts. It's these gray markers on, on the map, and they are, the details of the conflicts are here. So which flights are involved, uh, what is the minimum horizontal separation, minimum vertic vertical separation, and what is the time when these conflicts are expected to occur. And this is the actual look ahead, which is 60 minutes in this case. So by increasing the look ahead to 120 minutes, two hours, we can see that more conflicts uh, appear here. So we had three conflicts when we switched to two hours because we're looking further ahead, we identify another conflict. And then if we switch to four hours, we will identify even more conflicts down here. Obviously, not all of these predicted conflicts are equally likely to materialize. If we fill them up with these warnings, then they can be quite a nuisance to the operator. So what we tried to do in Compass was to produce safety patterns which can classify these predicted conflicts into, well, into conflicts that are likely to materialize and conflicts that are not very likely to materialize we will talk about how we did that. So effectively what we can do is we can augment this view with some patterns that can really turn some of these conflicts red and draw the operator's attention to these specific conflicts while keeping everything else um, gray. So what we have here is the patterns view. Here operators can enable and disable patterns. This is what a pattern looks like. So it's a small program, it's a small programming language script, which effectively calculates several properties of the conflict, and from them it calculates a number, and if that number is less than zero, it means that this is an important conflict. This is a conflict that is likely to happen based on this pattern. So then, when we turn this pattern on, you will see that we still have the same conflicts, but one of them is turned red which means that the system is trying to uh, draw the operator's attention to this specific conflict. So why this conflict? Why not other conflicts? Where do these uh, patterns uh, come from? How can we decide which conflict is, you know, needs to be turned to red and which not? I will let Massimiliano explain that. Okay, thank you very much. So, as already introduced, the point here is that we want to uh, extract somehow from data, from real data, from historical data, some safety pattern. So first of all, what are these safety patterns and why we need them? Well, a safety pattern are just some combination of elements extracted from the system that we know that they are somehow responsible or related <coughs> with the appearance of safety-related events. There is a very simple example. We all know that traffic density is somehow related to control the workload, and we know if there is a too high traffic density, this implies a very high workload, and then some problems may appear in the system, that is some safety-related event. 
So what we wanted to do is to bring this a little bit further and extract more information from historical data in order to detect more safety pattern and try to understand what is happening in the system. Of course we want to do this for its operational value in the sense that if we are able to forecast safety related event of course this is quite important. So uh, this was not that simple indeed we, because we have the several challenges. First of all there are a couple of challenges related with the data that we have analyzed. We have used historical data about flight trajectory trajectory and also meteorological data for the same time window. And the problem is that while well, we had some incompleteness in the data, data were not perfect, the resolution was not that perfect, but at the same time the size of the data that we were analyzing were quite huge, so there were uh, like uh, three, four hundred gigabytes of information, so it was not that straightforward to analyze. Also, the system is not that simple in the sense that, of course, safety events are very, let's say, infrequent. That's good, indeed, that we don't want to have too much safety-related event in the system. But this is really a challenge in order to understand what is behind the events, because you need a, a very large uh, set of examples in order to extract something meaningful. And also, the problem was the high dimensionality of the system, in the sense that there are a lot of elements that might contribute to the appearance of a safety event. So a direct study was not possible at this stage in the sense that we cannot just take all the trajectory, put them inside a data mining software and get a result. It was not going to happen. And uh, instead of that, we had to go to a, let's say, a two-step procedure. So in the first step, what we have done is that uh, taking all the initial data that we had, that includes mainly aircraft trajectory over Europe, what we have done is that we have extracted a set of features. And these features are nothing but very simple metrics that can be extracted from the data and that represent some kind of aspect of the system, some kind of uh, characteristics, let's say. So for instance, you may think that some of them are traffic density, delay of the two aircraft that are going to meet in the airspace, flight level, and so forth. We have a large set of features that we're going to present in the next slides. So when we have this large set of features, the second step will be to first select the ones that are really relevant. So we have to perform some kind of feature selection algorithm. We want to detect which ones are really relevant for the appearance of safety event. And second, what we want to do is to construct a global model. That is, we want a model, like uh, as was introduced before, such that we can put inside some numbers and get a number that tells us this event is going to be bad and this event is going to be good. We are trying to detect two kinds of events, of course. We have called this kind of event high events, in the sense they're of interesting events. We are going to check whether two aircraft are probably be involved in a loss of separation event in the near future, that is in the next five minutes. Suppose that we have this situation, we have two aircraft that are flying in the airspace, we we have the real trajectories, that is radar trajectory, so we know exactly more or less where they are in the airspace. And then we have their planet trajectory, that is essentially the, the flight plan. What we can do is that we can project their trajectories in the future and see where they will be in the next five minutes, for instance. And we can see that for some pairs of aircraft, we may have that they are going to cross their trajectories in the future, there may be some kind of loss of separation event. So, of course, this may evolve into two different situations. The first one, in the upper part, is that they are going through their trajectory and for some reason that we have to somehow assess, at the end we have a loss of separation event. This may happen, it's not very frequent, but it may happen. On the other hand, in the lower part, what you have is that uh, probably because of the intervention of the air traffic controller, of pilots or, or whatever, at the end, this uh, event is somehow solved. That is, the loss of separation is avoided, and what we have is a, a safe situation, while in the upper part, what we have is essentially is an unsafe situation. So what we want to do in this work on in this part is to understand whether there are some characteristics of the system that might be able to forecast if an event is going to be unsolved or solved. So essentially, detect if in the future we will have a loss of separation. This is a very simple example of two real trajectories extracted from real data. The one on the left is a safe one, and in the right is an unsafe one. And as you can see here in the right part, you have two trajectories, they are getting closer and closer, and at the end, the two aircraft are very close, too much close indeed, uh, until one of them is as the flight level changes. Well, here on the left is a solved event, and as you can see, the two aircraft are going toward the same point in, in space, but here, the black aircraft, that is a black trajectory, 
as a change in speed between these two points, maybe in speed or maybe in the trajectory. We don't have information inside this, let's say, this circuit. But at the end, what happened is that the two aircraft are uh, managed such that they avoid this uh, loss of separation here in the between. So this is an example on the left of a safe event and a solved event, and on the right of an unsolved event. Which kind of feature we have extracted in the read from the historical data? We have like three tiers or three layers of metrics. The first one is very simple. There are, let's say, classical features describing the state of the airspace. They are very classical in the sense there are traffic density, aircraft velocity, airspace structure, that is all the numbers that we can extract that represent somehow the usual way of analyzing the airspace. So they are quite interesting, but they are very well known, so it doesn't make sense to stop here for too much time. So the second tier is quite more interesting, and here we used some concepts that come from complexity sciences, so essentially from statistical physics. Here the idea is to try to measure the complexity of the flows of aircraft in the airspace, but not just just using the complexity in the ATM sense, that is the number of aircraft that you have in the sector and so forth. So we wanted to see how aircraft interact between them in some form. And we have done this by means of creating uh, networks representing the structure of uh, flights in the airspace. So suppose that this is our airspace, we make a snapshot and we have several flights. Then what we do is that we associate, let's say that we consider that each aircraft is a node and we connect a pair of them when their distance is lower than a given threshold. So essentially here what we can create is a network or a graph that is a mathematical object which is quite well known. And using this, what we can do is we can try to extract a set of metrics describing what is the structure created by the aircraft. There are plenty of metrics, I think, that we have extracted like 40 or 50, something like that describing how aircraft are interacting between each other. This is not going to be a lesson about uh, network metrics, so I will essentially skip this. If you have any question, you can ask me. But in any case, the point is that uh, in this part, what we have done is to try to represent the structure created by aircraft in the air. So somehow the interaction between them. The third tier is about history-based measures, as we call it. The point is that at some point of the project, we have this hypothesis that we wanted to test. Somehow, information about the past dynamics of the system should be relevant. That is, suppose that you are a controller and that you are very used to have a pair of aircraft entering your sector at a given time of the day. And you know that they are going to be in a loss of separation situation and you are very used to separate them. That is no problem. You are very used to that and then you can do it all the time without any further problem. The point is that suppose that one day that same pair of aircraft is entering your sector at a different time of the day, or maybe it's not even entering your sector, it's entering another sector. So this may create some kind of problem because you are not used to this new situation. And we want so how to catch this idea that is that the history, what happened in the past, should be somehow important to understand what is going to happen in the future. So what we have done is that we have developed a metric which is somehow assessing the synchronization between different aircraft. That is, we wanted to check if there is a common dynamics or a coherent dynamics among different days and different flights, and we wanted to check deviation from that. So what we have done is a set of measures that we have called trajectory synchronization likelihood, which has been derived from some metrics that are usually used in the analysis of brain dynamics. So we are going from biomedicine to a transport, a bit strange, it works indeed. And and the idea is just that detect if two aircraft are somehow coherent in their trajectory and if at some point of time they split. This was published in the ATM seminar of this year in Chicago, so if you want more information I can give you the papers about this. So okay, uh, we have a, set of, a large set of features and now the point is that we have to validate them, that is we have to understand if they are significant or not. How can we do that? Well, it's Indeed, it's quite simple. So let's suppose that we have uh, this feature, that is, this is a very simple one, is the number of aircraft around the event, so it's essentially the traffic density. What we are representing here is two histograms that correspond to the appearance probability of sold and unsold high event, depending on the number of aircraft that you have, that is on the traffic density. So as you can see, these two graphs should be somehow different. If they are the same, it means that this feature is not relevant for the appearance. It's not controlling the appearance of safe or unsafe event. 
So what we have done is essentially calculated two measures. The first one is very well known but at a distance. That is just the amount of overlap between two histograms. So essentially, the less overlap you have between the two histograms, the better it is. In the sense that this metric is somehow defining why a safety event is appearing or not. And the second one is that we have used a classification task. So the hypothesis behind this is that if you can use this feature to classify safe and unsafe event, that is to foresee if an event is going to be safe or not, and if you succeed in that, it means that this feature is, of course, relevant for the problem that you are analyzing. So what we have done is that we have used different classification algorithms in order to understand if each feature was relevant or not. So like in this case, you can see you have a classification score of 51%, is above 50%, that is statistically relevant. So essentially what it means is that, okay, we can somehow extract some little knowledge from the traffic density. And indeed here, as you can see on the right part, uh, when you have more traffic, what you have is that the probability of having unsolved event, which is the red bar, is higher than the other. So this confirms that the higher the traffic in one sector, the more frequent are the appearance of unsafe events. So here we are somehow uh, validating previous knowledge about the system. I don't want to, to show you all the 100 and something features that we have extracted. I'm going just to, to select uh, four of them that have been very significant for this task. So the first one is a phase of the flight. It was quite interesting. We have mapped the flight from zero to one, and zero was just takeoff, the beginning of the flight, and one was the landing, and any number in between is just the moment in flight. As you can see here, we have a quite clear difference between both histograms. And here, as you can see, the probability of having unsolved I event is much higher at the beginning of the flight. So it seems that you have more problem when you just, uh, let's say, climb and you just get en route. And that is the moment where most problems appear, probably because you are in a sector near one airport where you have a lot of uh, climbing and descending traffic and so forth. But in any case, we have seen that this is quite important. Then about uh, the networks representation that I've shown you before, I don't want to enter exactly in what each measure means, but essentially what we have seen is that the worst situation is when you have a set of aircraft more or less distributed on the airspace and they are creating connection between, I mean they are creating like groups. That is, they are close to each other but forming like clusters of aircraft. It seems that this is somehow creating a lot of attention spots for the controller. So the controller has to check a lot of group of aircraft at the same time. And this um, is very time consuming for him. And this seems quite important. Then about uh, trajectory synchronization likelihood, what we have seen is that we have confirmed our hypothesis. So the right situation in which you have two aircraft that are going through the same route all the days of the year is a very good situation. Controllers are used to it. But on the other side, when you have the same pair of aircraft entering a different sector or a different situation, this is an expected situation and is quite bad for appearance of safety event. And the good point of all of this is that we didn't just confirm common knowledge about what are the factors that are important for the appearance of loss of separation, but we can mathematically measure them and demonstrate that they are relevant. An unexpected, I would say, result of this analysis was the problem of the stationarity of the system. So what we have detected is that not all the factors, not all the features are important to all the year. For instance, in summer, when we have high traffic, the traffic density is very important. So if you have a lot of traffic, of course, you have to be very careful on what you are doing. But on the other hand, in winter, when we have a lower traffic, what we have seen is that then the trajectory synchronization likelihood and the phase of flight are much more important than the number of aircraft there are. In there. So this is quite interesting, and I think that we should study this a little bit better, how the system is non-stationary and may change along, along the year. And of course, this may at some point lead to the design of an adaptive safety metric that is not just a general safety metric, but let's see how it's traffic and let's see how we can improve the detection of safety events. So just to conclude, I would like to say that this part, that is Work Package 1 in this project, was really a pioneer research in the application of data science and data mining to aviation safety. I think that we are almost the first doing this. Thanks to this, what we have done is that we could define some new safety metrics. They are quite important because they are not lagging. That is, we are able to detect, to forecast the appearance of safety events, not just counting in the past how many we had. And they are based on complex relationships 
leadership. That is, we are not just checking a couple of numbers, but what we are doing is that we are analyzing the relationship between different aircraft in the airspace. And this is quite novel. Of course, we need more research to be done in this field because what we would like to do at least is to have more data set of, even with enhanced resolution. The resolution of this data set was not perfect and due to that we could not check loss of separation, for instance, in TMA, which could be quite interesting, but we would need a much higher resolution in order to do that. And of course, we need the research, but the benefit for air transport, I think that are uncountable, not just for air traffic management, ATM, but in general, because this may be applied to situations like uh, automation in order to detect how a new automation may affect the behavior of the system. And we can use this to track the evolution of airspace condition, that is not just analyze safety, but analyze the stationarity of the system or, or how it evolves in time. And of course, this is a breakthrough in tactical safety management because we are introducing some metrics that are completely new. It's a way of analyzing safety which is quite new. But this is not just safety because this, in principle, can be applied to other aspects of air transport, like, for instance, security might be another one. But this is outside the scope of the project. So if you have any question, we have several papers that have been published on this part. So now we are moving to the work package too. Thank you, Massimiliano. In the following slides, um, this is going to be a slight cut and it's a different topic. Um, as mentioned before, I'm a computer scientist, so I'm going to talk about ICT approaches from, from this side. And uh, additional aspects we examined, we researched on in the project were other approaches to modeling the complexity of an ATM system. Just to give a brief overview, we built a DSL, a domain-specific language-based specification mechanism for operational scenarios of ATM, especially with the aim to support the definition of operational scenarios which aid at the creation of new safety patterns and which also constitute a different approach for configuring pattern matching mechanism. I'm going to go into the background of some of these technologies in more detail later. The realizations I'm going to show you are based on analysis of um, the domain, the ATM domain and data, mainly all of T and meter data. Of course, we also built a prototype of this and integrated it into the ESWS, the Early Safety Warning System, uh, which Dimitri has presented beforehand. Domain-specific modeling. Models exist in various domains. Every domain has its own models. The software has its own models. You might know the UML. Of course, there are a lot of graph-based mathematical models, which we've seen just before. The problem of some of these models are that they are not suited very well for specific domains. This is due to lack of expertise from the domain experts and also because typically modeling languages are focused on specific software engineering problems and they simply lack the specific domain concepts. So one solution for this are domain-specific languages. Domain-specific languages are custom-tailored, computer-interpretable languages, and they typically consist of the concepts of a specific domain. For instance, instead of talking about objects or classes, I could talk about flights, I could talk about points, locations, so really concepts of the domain. These languages are a possible foundation for advanced technologies such as analysis of models and particularly coming from software engineering to generate software, but also to configure systems to be interpreted, uh, as we will see later, and to provide advanced tool support to aid domain experts when creating models of their domain. So for the project, what we then try to do is to create a language to express operational scenarios of ATM, which is the domain of the project. We took a look at this and what could these models then be used for? As mentioned before, we have a prototype implementation of a conflict detection me mechanism and with operational scenarios we could aid the creation of these safety patterns that then detect conflicts. On the other hand, domain experts can then experiment with models to express specific situations of ATM that are of some kind of interest. For instance, these are situations that are dangerous or unwanted, in turn then can be used to configure a system to detect this. So what we have come up with is the operational scenario specification language, which is a domain specific language to express these operational scenarios. And the domain concepts we have integrated into this language are quite typical flights with all the attributes, uh, that is the profile they are executing, made up of points at specific locations and flight levels and uh, also times. 
from the aircraft that performs a flight and okay, as mentioned before the profiles and points but we also have the possibility to express models of weather as mentioned before based on meter and the airspace configuration. Um, the problem of course is that if you explicitly model a concrete situation of air traffic these can get pretty big. We heard about 400 gigabyte of data, okay this was an entire year um, but we also experimented on extracting these models from all FT data and one day of all FT of one sector resulted in a model which was I think 10,000 lines of um, this DSL so it's really big and additionally such big models do not focus on on interesting aspects of the situation. Just to give a brief example what such a DSL might look like, it's text-based of the language, so it's um, as known from GPS, regular programming languages, but also other modeling languages. It consists of keywords, which are then, of course, domain-specific. Okay, so we're talking about scenarios, which consist of weather and of flights and of profiles and so forth. This uh, is a meter model with um, the elements, uh, with, for example, wind and clouds and so forth. We also have literals, which are then these numbers or string literals and also some enumeration values which come from the domain. This is just to give, give a brief overview. So this is what it could look like. Of course, these block elements with the brackets, these are just syntactic elements. They could look different. As mentioned before, these models can get very big and if you want to express a specific fact of a scenario which is of interest, for example, two particular flights that somehow interact with each other in an unwanted way, we wanted to introduce mechanisms that allow to focus on these aspects. That is, the domain experts have the possibility to omit certain elements which are not of interest. For example, I'm just going to jump back to the previous slide. Um, there are two flights, but this model does not say anything about the aircraft that perform these flights. These are just flights. And also, apparently, these are not complete. There's just a small section of the flight. There are just two positions uh, for each of the flights, and they're, in a sense, incomplete. But this might be the interesting part of these two flights, which is to be examined or which plays a specific role in this scenario. Sub-elements of these models are optional. The domain experts do not need to specify the aircraft which performs the flight, and they do not need to specify all profile elements. Additionally, we added support to not only use concrete literals, for example numbers, but also alternatives or range. So one could specify there is a flight that uh, not flies only at a specific flight level, but the flight level and above somewhere, or between in a, in a range. We also supported um, name-based references for reusability. For example, one could define a profile, give it a name, and then model several flights would then just perform this profile without copy-pasting things, just to make it more feasible to express models and to enforce reusability. This is similar to the example before. I'd just like to highlight that here, for example, there's another a different flight model here and there you can see okay this is one position and apparently it's uh, latitude longitude but it's not specific value so it's somewhere uh, from uh, 51 uh, that's latitude or longitude and higher and so this is essentially saying that at this position the flight is uh, in a specific quadrant of a sector and here for example this flight um, it does not say anything about the profile this flight actually performs it's just uh, specifies that there's a flight with an aircraft um, and departing from EGMH and to EGCC. Eventually we integrated a prototype implementation of this language into the early safety warning system. As mentioned before, this prototype integration supports analysis of the operational scenario as we have seen before with the OLFT with the radar data. So the ESWS can not only perform conflict detection on OLFT data, but also on these operational scenarios. The integration also supports to extract these models, which are expressed in the OSL, the operational scenario language, from OLFT. So one could use historical OLFT data to base artificial operational scenarios on real data. Here I just want to highlight the integration. This is similar to the screenshots we've seen before. We have this map here, which shows the flights and the trajectories. And um, the new thing is that here we have a text editor where you can see the OSL, also with syntax highlighting mm -hmm. and so forth. And here is a selected flight which performs the profile which is then here. 
And this profile can be edited here. Flights can be added to the scenario, removed, and then the analysis can be executed on this changed scenario with additional flights, with changed trajectories, and so forth. Before I demonstrate how we evaluated uh, the safety patterns produced by Work Package 1, I'd like to give you a very brief live demo of the application you've been seeing screenshots of. So here is the uh, early safety warning system. You can see the, the map here. Yes, it doesn't really help. Uh, here we have the map, we have uh, the, the traffic. So by selecting an aircraft, you could see its, its properties here, if the resolution was, uh, was high enough. And then what we can do is uh, we can, can enable radar, and you can see that flights are you know, kind of jumped, because here the previous, um, the previous situation was with uh, the, the flight plans. So this is the location of the aircraft according to the flight plans. And this is what actually, what actually happened. Uh, and then we can perform a conflict, uh, conflict detection. So, say if we move our time to 6.38, we see that we have, uh, we have a conflict uh, in the airspace. All conflicts are, by definition, uh, at this stage, they are unfiltered. So they are all, uh, all gray. They are all considered to be safe. Uh, but then what we can do, it, as I said, is we can turn uh, patterns on and then we can see that some of these conflicts will turn um, unsafe. So here we have again one conflict, zero conflicts. Right. So here you can see that at 6.36 we have a conflict that is uh, safe and a conflict that is uh, unsafe. A conflict that is likely to, to materialize based on the pattern detected by work package 1. So can you, sorry, can, can you can sure. just explain how do you differentiate between safe and unsafe? It's based on the likelihood that it's... Yes, so what happens is, we, uh, based on the work from, uh, that Massimiliano presented, um, we calculate a score for each conflict and we classify it as safe, which is not likely to materialize, or unsafe, which is likely to materialize and which should be an, an attention spot. So we should see that here is the unsafe conflict and here is the, the safe one. And the classification has been done using the, the factors extracted from data mining. It means that if there is no ATC interventions, your a green spot will become red. I mean, that will, that will end up in a conflict. Actually, both of these are predicted conflicts. Yes. Right? So if ATC does nothing, both conflicts will materialize. This means that based on past data, ATC will probably do something about this and get it solved with a higher probability than this one. So. This one needs more attention, so in a way. So you draw the attention of the ad code towards that specific one yeah, yeah. by highlighting so it once. This one has historically been proven to be easy to solve, while this one needs more attention. So that's, that's uh, the, whole, the whole idea, being able to classify these, uh, these conflicts. But at the, at the end, the point here is that it's additional information. Yes, it's additional. It replace no, 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 no. existing flow. So it adds no. context, which today they don't have. So something that is not there. And it's quite far ahead in time, so it can be used you know, for tactical reasons. For example, no, exactly. if you see that in four hours you have a lot of these interesting conflicts, then... For example, this aspect of repetitivity, you call it synchronization. Mm -hmm. right? uh, so this plays also in the score. Yeah, well, not in this specific something, pattern. Something which is new, there's more exactly. likelihood for becoming relevant. Pretty much.
Yes, something that deviates a lot from, stand, from the standard situation. So this is actually translated into an equation that takes vertical deviations, the number of aircrafts, a horizontal deviation and time deviation into account, calculates a score, and if the score is less than zero, then the conflict is marked as unsafe, and it's reported as red on the, uh, on the map. Which controller are you giving this information to? Is it the tactical controller, the planet controller? Currently we just produce this information, now how it, how it can be put in, um, I mean in, in use. It's a, different, uh, it's a different story. So if it's the air, air traffic controller that should be exposed to this information, or perhaps uh, at a more tactical level, this is, I mean, it was not our purpose to really say, you know, how it should fit in operationally. We have, pa we have patterns produced from, from work package one. Uh, we can demonstrate them, we can match them against real data. The question is, how good are these patterns in general? This is just a repetition of the pattern. So this is the pattern. You can see that it refers to things like vertical deviation, numbers of aircrafts, etc., etc. What we need to do is we need to be able to evaluate these patterns on large sets of data to see if they make sense or not. The system I've shown you is a single machine UI-based, you know, a desktop-based application, which is good for visualizing things, but it's not very useful for batch processing. So if we wanted to use this system to analyze many days of data and the conflicts and whether the conflicts did happen or not, it would be a very slow way of doing that. So what we needed to do was to produce an implementation of the conflict analysis and pattern matching facilities that could run on a distributed computing environment without a user interface. The architecture that we came up with was, a, as I said, a distributed architecture where you have many worker nodes that can evaluate a safety pattern for one sector and one day. And then you have a node that kind of coordinates the whole process and collects the result. We implemented this as a service-oriented architecture where all components talk to each other through a dedicated middleware called the Enterprise Service Bus that does load balancing automatically. So this is a quick overview of what's going on. So suppose that we need to evaluate a pattern for this airspace and these three dates. Uh, what we can do is we can delegate each date to a different worker node so we can parallelize the process and we can complete the process of evaluation at a reduced uh, time. So we have one server that is the coordinator and then an arbitrary number of servers that can evaluate particular patterns against particular dates. So for this setup we used the three dedicated servers. One played the role of the coordinator and two were the workers. We also used a separate setting of a cluster which was running outside of this architecture just to get additional data. And this is an interesting part. So with a 60 minute look ahead, when we looked at 44 days of data across all the sectors of Europe, the pattern produced by Work Package 1 gave 86% correct predictions, 5% false positives, and 9% false negatives. A well, false positive is when the pattern classified a conflict as important, but the conflict ended up not happening. A false negative is when the pattern classified the conflict as not important, but the conflict ended up happening. Which percentage of predicted conflict did actually happen in the historical data that would be useful to know to classify whether the 86% is good performance or not? Yes, I don't have this data immediately available, but I can, I can get back uh, to you about this. So you mean how, this, how the top percent breaks down between conflicts that no, no, no. were predicted? No, no, no. In, in the historical data, which percentage of the conflicts were actually happening? Because if your prediction would be, let's just classify everything as not critical, right. but maybe your performance would be better than 86%. Yes. It was like 4%, I guess, but I mean, the 4% of events were not safe. But indeed, in, um, in Deliverable 1.3, if I'm not wrong, we tackled this point and we showed that indeed we were above that. Yes. Uh, so we were above a random classification, like for 10 times better, something like that. So it was, was significant. Very good question, but yeah, we tackled that. 
we also did the sanity check, so we drank the look ahead to 10 minutes from 60 minutes, and then the 86 became more than 90, but this is on a very small data set just for a sanity check. And this is the distribution across the different, the distribution of correct predictions, false negatives and positives across the 44 days we tried this. So we can see that it's more or less consistent. Yes. Yeah, yeah that, that actually closes the presentation. Okay, thank you very much right. to the presenters. Thank you. Excellent timekeeping, even with a few interruptions. So now the floor is open. <laughs> <laughs> The floor is open. Well, it's just a clarification on your 60 minute look ahead. Mm -hmm. What is the proportion of data between radar data and flight plan data? How, how do you mix these data? We look at, at radar tracks up to the point in time we are now and flight plans in the future. So we don't look at real, looking at real data in the future would be cheating. So we're looking at flight plans from right. now onwards to predict the we do trajectory extrapolation based on... Uh, okay. So, for example, you extrapolate, uh, you, you use the current speed yes. to do the prediction. Yeah. We are working with positions more. Yeah. But yeah, we're not looking, although we have future real data, we don't, don't yeah. use it because it's not realistic. We had a few questions here on this side, so maybe we go to the SJU for the first one or two questions. One of the questions was, at the, at the graph which uh, in excess was showing, there were three aircraft or four, and it was the table where they were saying that the aircraft are separated. So there is one aircraft and there is aircraft separation. I just was wondering, what is the separation in nautical miles which you consider? Yes. What is the separation which you are taking under consideration in this? This is a very interesting question. So uh, what we have done is that, uh, in principle, we don't have, uh, let's say, a, a best solution because we could try to, to speak with our traffic controllers and so forth and try to understand what is the best value. But what we have decided to do was to use data to extract this value. So what we have done is that we have essentially run, uh, constructed this network with different values and then selected the one that was most uh, that was the, the best in terms of relevance for the problem. So if I'm not wrong, the the distance, the internal distance was like uh, uh, five or six nautical mile, and uh, the external was uh, one was like uh, 28 or something like that. So essentially, the distance between two aircraft was very small. Uh, but the number of aircraft that we had to include in the, for creating the network was quite high, so we considered like high uh, pieces of the, of the airspace. At my Genspace training, which I did at Brittany, we, we were working on different sectors, and as I understood, as an air traffic controller, you work and you manage different sectors. You don't work only on one sector. How would you manage this in the project, actually? Okay, th this is not a problem from the, the data mining point of view. And indeed, we have just presented uh, one week ago uh, a contribution in the Social Innovation Days in Stockholm where just yeah, we were demonstrating right. yeah, that uh, sectors are not that relevant as it seems. So uh, in this case, it will not be a problem because I can construct networks centered in any point and uh, indeed I can just uh, uh, avoid the, the sector structure. So uh, we can include that or we can... Uh, avoid this. no no problem about that based on the research results which you have at the moment what are the future long term research results on which you want to build in the future which are the really important ones which you think it's worth to build upon so what do we want to do with this in the future well i think that uh, i have a slide uh, these are the three main points that we want to tackle. First of all is that, or maybe this is just the last one, this is a new way of analyzing or of managing safety. That is not just analyzing what happened in the past, in the last year or whatever, counting the number of events that we had, but we want to do something more like a tactical safety management in the sense that we want to look in the future and be able to forecast what will be the safety in the future. This is for safety, but we can go farther than that and 
For instance, what we can do is that we can try to check or to tackle or to track the evolution of the dynamics of the system through time, which is the second point. That is, let's suppose that we have an airspace. What we can do is that we can extract some metrics, like this one that we have presented, and understand how the dynamics changes with time. So maybe at the beginning you have uh, low traffic, so some factors are more important, and then this changes, and you want to be prepared for that. And the third point is that, of course, this can be applied outside air traffic management. So, for instance, we are thinking in going to management of automation. So we know the system as it is now. What we can do is that we can uh, have an additional automated system and see how the safety pattern, but not just safety pattern, that is the dynamics of the system changes due to the presence of this automation. So these, I think, are the three main points that uh, we would like to tackle in the future. Let's first see if the other partners want to add on that last question. I think it would also be interesting to try to bring in more sources of data, because currently we're only working with flight plans and uh, um, uh, weather data, but perhaps there are other, other sources of data that can be of interest to take into consideration for specifying these patterns. And it's also um, interesting to see whether there are sector-specific patterns. So we said that in the general case, sectors don't seem to be that important. But Sorry about, sure. what about the radar data? What was we have, so we've already used radar data and flight plans and weather data. But uh, we would like to explore other potential sources of, of data that could be of, uh, of interest. For example, data that only uh, operators have access to or only uh, national service providers have to. Because they, these, the data sources we got were from uh, CFMU. Anybody wants to build on that? So yeah. just a question. So sure. finally, the patterns that you identified are not based on the uh, effective way the controllers solved co some conflicts. They are not based. I mean, on, no. on analyzing the radar data and comparing it against the initial flight plan data. We took that into consideration when we calculated the uh, vertical vertical diversion and the horizontal diversion. So we knew how far away the flights were from where they were supposed to be according to the flight plan. Just to be precise on this point, yeah, yeah because Dimitri yeah. said flight plans and I think that's where you got confused. No, they were not flight plans, they were trajectories, but it's what the CFMU, sorry, what Prince provided, which is what they call OLFT plus data, and that has two minutes resolution or something like that. And that's the resolution they have, and there's other data sets out there. For instance, we could do this with ADSB. And we are collecting ADSB data now, but obviously to have all the DSB data in Europe is not 50 gigabytes. So it's, but it's trajectory data, it's not flight plans. Okay, it's trajectory so just, data with two minutes just resolution. To clarify, so there is a conflict according to the flight plans between two aircraft, one which has to climb, another which is stable, for example. Nevertheless, the rules there in that specific sector is that the controller is, will uh, stabilize uh, level, level well, of that aircraft earlier. Data. And that is a and that is, and that because is it's seen in your trajectory. But for instance, what we couldn't use is TMA, I mean, we couldn't do in, any TMA no, analysis. No, because the rules are Because two minutes, yeah, yeah. In two minutes, in, two minutes in the TMA, the situation, you just, I mean, you may have a conflict, and yeah, after yeah. two minutes, you don't have a conflict at all, so you totally yes. miss the conflict. And also the rules are much So I think it would be just to run this with other data sets, okay. and also include... Um, but the only data set that we use was what uh, PRISM provided. Okay, uh, understand. Okay. That is the OLFT+. Oh, it's clear enough. And also 10 months, because when we started the project, I think, well, before they had an uh, OLFT, right? But what we needed was an OLFT+, and that has now like one year and a half, so we got the first 10 months. Okay, the second question was about the, um, those bubbles, uh, those uh, the, the network that you were presenting, the okay, net between sure. the aircraft. No, it, it's just... So you expressed it in terms of uh, lateral, lateral buffers, let's Correct. call them like that. I suppose you addressed also in vertical layers or buffers. No, no, at this stage, uh, I mean, in this project, we didn't do that because, uh, well, for several reasons. First, because we wanted to be sure. I mean, we wanted to tackle simple situation that we could understand well. So we wanted to reduce at minimum all the, you know, the complexity, okay. the complication so of the system. It was just a simplification, yeah. but in the future... We in might, the future, of course, it can be done whatever you want in 4D or whatever. So. And third, just... Uh, 
according to so just uh, to help in uh, answering the question from uh, Stella. Stella, I think uh, as an application that I see in, with respect to the projects where, uh, where I'm involved in Cesar, you know there are some short-term ATFCM measures which for the time being are based only on the uh, entry counts and occupancy counts mm. in a sector. And if we add to that this kind of prediction with complexity count, let's call it complexity mm -hmm. indices, uh, this will uh, allow to design these st stamp measures in more finely. Occupancy yeah, was one of the first things we tried and which we also visualized in this system. So then we moved on to more complicated, uh, more complicated things. So here, for example, we have the occupancy graph for this sector how many flights are expected to be in the sector. Because sometimes we might have a big occupancy, but there is yeah. no complexity, so it's not an issue in terms of workload. Okay, let's go back to the SCU. For, okay, for well, the thank you very much for your answers. We have just uh, two, three more questions. Dylan. Hi, I just want to ask, what was the level of participation of the air traffic controllers? To your project. At the very beginning of the project, we uh, met uh, with air traffic controllers at the Barcelona uh, ACC, and they gave us guidelines about the things that they consider important as factors, as safety factors, scenarios that they consider to be, um, you know, of interest. Uh, and then, uh, when we had the first prototype of the system, we actually uh, did a, a demo for them. Uh, for the same team and uh, they provided us with feedback based on which we updated the system. But I think what is really important about this project is that our findings are not based on the intuition of air traffic controllers, they are based on hard data. So we actually had to, to mine real data to see what is really important in terms of uh, uh, of, uh, of safety, because the intuition of air traffic controllers, I mean, they, they are people, they, it can be skewed. So we really wanted to look at hard data to extract our conclusions. Does this answer your question? Yeah, I ask this question because in the pub publishable summary, there are some interesting statements that I, d I do not aware of. For instance, you talked of ACAS, and you stated that ACAS suffers from short-term look at time and as far as I know ACAS is a last resort system and its look ahead time should be short and also you talk of some MTCDs with a look ahead time of 60 minutes and I have never heard of an MTCD with a 60 minute look ahead time and also here you stated that STCA may offer resolutions, vertical resolutions or lateral resolutions to the controllers and I'm not still aware of any STCA system that offers lateral and vertical resolution matters. That's why I asked, and there are some statements like this through your paragraphs, in your paragraphs. So regarding the, the look-ahead time, uh, the way we've built the system is, um, is quite parametric. So as you could see in the, in the slides, we can arbitrarily increase the look-ahead time. Obviously, the more we increase the look-ahead time, the more the accuracy of the system uh, suffers. So the 60 minutes was just what we ran our evaluation on. This is, this is just one look ahead value. The system can evaluate uh, more look ahead, uh, look ahead values. One more question. Mm -hmm. um, how, how did you uh, classify if a solution, uh, if sorry, if a confliction likely to be solved or not? What, what, what was your point? in that and how did you do that? Likely to be solved or not? Yes, yeah, so I think I'll give this one to Massimiliano. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, you refer to the, to the um, let's say, work package one in the sense when we analyze historical data or when we do this on the, let's say, on the tool? So how do, given a conflict, how do we decide whether it's going to be solved? Massimiliano had a slide earlier in his presentation, yeah. I think it was like six, seven, and there was solved and unsolved conflicts. Six. Actually, mm -hmm. at the celebration days, I had the same questions. So, as far as I understood, this system do not take into consideration that it's assessed as likely to be unsolved, and I just thought if it can have some safety impacts, how can you predict if it's to be solved or not? 
Yeah, so what we yeah. do is that uh, we detect a situation like the one in the left part, that is we know that two aircraft are planned to cross each other or to be in a loss of separation situation in the future. Then what we do is that we check the real data that we have, that is the real trajectories of the aircraft. So somehow here we, we are cheating in the sense that as we are analyzing historical data, what we can do is to check uh, the real evolution of the system that has happened in the past. So what we do is that we just check whether the two aircraft were going to be closer than a given uh, uh, distance or that they didn't end in a loss of separation. So this, is, this was your question, no? Yeah, this was my question, yes. So you, as you compared it with historical data and you looked at it if added controller intervention happened or not. Correct. Well, you may have also a controller intervention, but you may end up in an unsafe situation because maybe the controller intervention was not uh, strong enough or was not correct or whatever. I mean, you can. we just detected that the, the final situation was not as good as we wanted. By the way, can you tell me what is a reduced safety pattern? The safety pattern that work package one uh, that Massimiliano's work uh, produced uh, was depending on looking at past days of data, right? So for if we were to classify a conflict uh, from today, we would have to have pre-computed data for the last 20, uh, 20 days, right? Which was uh, not very efficient uh, in, a, in a live mode. So what we did was we replaced one of these, uh, one of the features, the computationally expensive feature, with one that was more, co more efficient uh, to compute, and we came up with a reduced safety pattern that has lower accuracy, but is more computationally efficient to produce. Okay, then I go back to this side and give the floor to Chris. Yeah, I like very much what you're, what you're doing, just in the degree that you can automate this process, like for example knowing whether there was controller intervention, um, did you have radar uh, recordings of the, the radio that the controller no. was using? No. So you were just looking at the tracks yeah, to see it. if there was a deviation and was that by inspection visually uh, offline? Uh, one case by case, or did you? All no, 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 no. This was completely automated because we were we are talking about uh, I mean, uh, th uh, three hundred gigabyte of information. We are talking about uh, one hundred thousand solved event and four thousand unsolved event. So it's absolutely impossible to do this manually. So all of this was completely automated, and uh, just let's say that the results were uh, discussed with uh, a traffic controller just to, to be sure that this makes sense and this is uh, what we should expect. I was particularly interested in the safety metrics identification and, uh, and we have a few NSPs, for instance NATS currently with five facts. They are experiencing very low records uh, of separation losses. So they try to identify metrics for before something end up with a uh, separation loss, otherwise they will uh, declare they are safe already and they, are, they get into a complacency thing. So, I wasn't, so now, what I, I'm not fully understood so far is the usage you've made of big data or, or data mining, or whatever. Is it to identify new safety metrics and or is it to validate that a certain metric can be used as a surrogate to safety? Because, I mean, that has a big cost and I, I'm just wondering whether most of these things would not have come from a discussion with uh, subject matter experts, for instance. So what, what, what are the benefit of going into that kind of processing? In particular, if we go into the analysis of the radio stuff at the end of the day, that right. makes a, quite a cost for... So what is your feeling about the, right. the benefit? Right. So simplified answer and you do. Okay. So <laughs> the, the thing is that at the, at the end, when you have a complex phenomena, you may try to develop a model, right? That, but at the end, you can go there, you can go that far, right? At the end, you have too many uh, factors just influencing the model. You cannot have like 20 parameters, 30 variables. Uh, at the end, it's never exact, right? So all the data mining techniques, they're based on analyzing large chunks of data sets and develop methodologies to analyze which is the combination of those data sets that best classify whatever event you want, right? So now you can use it for different things. You can use it as a metric, and you can use it as how this metric evolved. You could do what Massimiliano mentioned, that it's an adaptable metric, 
to see different airspace is for instance i mean nowadays since we don't have that many safety metrics then whatever we have we have to use the same for every aerospace right but i'm pretty sure that we keep on the work on this they will be different depending on the aerospace and that doesn't mean that a certain airspace is unsafer than other but probably those metrics they evolve and they need to evolve in the right direction right so answering your question it could be used for a for a number of things right it could be used for developing metrics and trying to have a feeling on how different airspace chunks could have different metrics could be analyzed on um, what Massimiliano mentioned before, how automation, when automation, a automation solution is introduced, if those metrics, the problem is that when you talk about safety metric, obviously if it's a low score, obviously people say unsafe, right? That's what we call these interesting events, just trying to avoid all connotations about unsafe, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but it also could be used, you mentioned, I said, automation, um, uh, development of metrics, and it could be used as a as a tactical tool, although obviously that's a little bit farther, right? I mean, I guess that that was the low answer. That was no, no, that was the that was the simple answer. I don't know if you need to add. No. Well, I would just like to add that uh, indeed you can use this to to check existing metrics, and we have done something like this in the in the last necessary innovation days when where I demonstrate that uh, a traffic count, aircraft count inside one sector is essentially yeah. meaningless. You have to use more other ways. But I think that in this project at least we have, uh, we have focused on the other aspect that is the creation of completely new metrics. Oh. This is quite interesting because at the end when you are validating existing metrics we are taking knowledge that already exists and we are just validating that. On the other side if you can use data to create new metrics, indeed what we are doing is that we are extracting new knowledge from the system. I, I personally I think it's much more interesting mm -hmm. that way. So, And actually you look at the results of the KDD, you know KDD is the knowledge, uh, uh, knowledge, yeah, knowledge discovery. discovery and data mining uh, congress that they have every year and they have competitions. At the end they do exactly the same. I think that the, la the one last year they have like three parameters, something like that, that was combination of several data sets, but the original competition provided like, like 2500 data sets, mm -hmm. something like that, right? So the trick is just to combine this in a way that you can classify something. I'll go back to the SGU. Is there, is there anything more, Stella? One more question. Just one I have. Uh, is this to an MTCD or a, a support to MTCD? That's what you're working on. You know, we try to, we try to classify interesting events. Now, how it's going to be used in, in practice or where it's going to be integrated is a different question. So it might be used at the tactical level or it might be uh, something that operators could be exposed to. It, it was not really in the scope of the project to decide you know, how this should be applied, in which phase of the air traffic management process it should be applied. It just w wanted to demonstrate that by using this pattern-based classification we can get a good a distinction between interesting and perhaps less interesting in events. I think it has also to be seen, and Komard have said that from the beginning, I thought, as a complementary mm. source of information. It is not there to replace one or the other yes. of the current tools. Whether it now applies to a supervisor or a controller or, yeah, or maybe even some government. other... I ask this question because uh, it didn't seem to me that it fits into the ACC room, control room. It's much more, it seemed to me that it's much more related with this ATFCM stuff and dynamic capa demand and capacity. Yeah, th that That's is why. deployment, I guess. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, if you look at it from... Um, I mean, we create ATC systems and for us, in the roadmap, this is an interesting thing to do. We established that in the meeting where Mark was uh, last week, uh, in fact, two weeks ago, that we found this is something we don't currently have in our systems, and we would like to get that as an additional panel or screen or whatever to provide this information. So, ATFCM, yeah, but we, wouldn't, we shouldn't exclude ATC systems from having this capability later on. Thank you, that's on the side of the SGU. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think with that we close and thank again the presenters. Thanks. Thank you.